recording because we are live streaming this, but here is my own local recording. Now you should get on your screen popping up a little thing asking you to consent to be recorded. Um, sometimes it takes the system a minute or two to actually process that. Just accept that when you get it. When people are speaking, I'm going to highlight the speaker. So they will be the only one that will actually be shown. And as I said uh, earlier, uh, and I'll repeat again for people who weren't here when I started, we, people will be on mute during the first part of the session when the presenters are giving their statements and then there's some questions that Amitabh as the chair will ask them. And after that, we will open it up for Q&A. And if you would like to ask a question orally, raise your hand and we will recognize you and you can unmute yourself at that point. We'll give you the capacity to do that. Or I will have the chat open at that point and you can feel free to put questions in the chat. And occasionally I will hoist the questions out of the chat. So if you have a question, don't feel compelled to actually have to deliver the question orally. Um, and uh, if it is uh, better for you to not be on camera, feel free to not have your camera on, no obligation for that. But Amitav and I did decide to do this not as a webinar, but actually as as a Zoom meeting because sometimes we do actually like to see other people and have a little bit more of a feeling of kind of a seminar interaction. So we make the best of what we can given the uh, extraordinary circumstances of the global pandemic. Unfortunately, Vindulka uh, Klubakova was unable to join us this morning, but we do have three, well, we do have at least two speakers in the room and a third who we're trying to figure out how to get logged on right now. Ah, the third speaker has just arrived. So let me just pause for one second while I get our third speaker into the room and get her all set up. So let me see. Here we have Deepshika. There you are. Who's connecting to, yeah. To the yep, she is connecting. And as soon as she is connected, then I will actually make her also a co-host which as you know, in Zoom gives you all these incredible powers, uh, mostly the power to mute and unmute yourself, which is the important thing. All right, so all three of us are here, that's great. Um, with that, by my way of introducing things, I'm going to put on my tech hat for the remainder of the uh, first part of the session here, and then I'll help with the Q&A a little bit later on. But I'm going to turn this over to Amitav to say his own words of introduction and get us started. Instead of having two separate panels today, because we only have three speakers, we're going to have all three of the speakers speak in the beginning. Amitav's going to ask some questions to get a discussion going. We'll open it up for Q&A. We may not run all the way for two hours. Uh, we will let the conversation go where it goes. Amitav. Greetings. Thank you, Patrick. And uh, greetings to everybody, especially speakers from New Delhi, from San Francisco, and from New York. Um, I will not take much time because we have lost a few minutes, but I'd like to highlight those of you who are not, uh, who have not attended uh, the first two dialogues, just a couple of uh, words in terms of introduction. Uh, those, these dialogues are um, initiative of our school. Um, Dean Christian Chin uh, not only initiated, suggested this uh, idea of these dialogues, but she also gave words of welcome in the very first dialogue, which uh, whose recording <clears throat> we, you will find. Uh, we can send it to you if you want. Uh, the thing about uh, the, the overall theme, global IR, I have said various different things in different uh, previous sessions, but let me just say two things now. One is that, uh, you know, Laura, the, this, uh, this series of three that we are holding in February, March, we may hold some in the fall. We're thinking of doing something fall and they could be more specific, but these three have been more general. They are about discussing, in a sense, for the lack of a better word, state of international relations as a uh, field, but we, also include international studies. Uh, it's not about IR in a political science sense. Uh, it's international studies broadly defined, including IR. Uh, but uh, this is, uh, have been a way of discussing where uh, uh, the field is uh, heading. Although a lot of uh, this type of general discussions, the state of IR, state of the field, state of the art. Uh, so they ask the question, where is the field going? We, on the other hand, ask it differently. We say where the field is not going and where it should be going. Um, this is because as uh, some of you who know the literature on global IR, um, this is kind of a movement um, to, 
to address, to challenge uh, the Western dominance or Eurocentrism or whatever you call it, uh, whatever centrism, the exclusion of uh, or the marginalization of voices other than uh, those of uh, the core, Western core, United States, and to some extent, to lesser extent, Europe. So this is about what, uh, where the field is not going and where it should be going. And here we'd look uh, at uh, ideas and voices and contributions of uh, uh, scholarships uh, and scholars from around the world. The other related point is that uh, the purpose of uh, these dialogues, including uh, the idea of global IR, is not just normative. I mean, you know, there's a lot of stuff written around on this topic, which is literature is growing, how to make the field more inclusive how, uh, or universal. And these are kind of normative, high sounding normative goals. But our uh, uh, purpose is not just normative, although it is important, but it's also to add, to enrich the field with more explanatory firepower and more understanding, understanding and explanation. Mm -hmm because uh, there is a strong case to be made, and some of us have already made that, that uh, by remaining beholden to a very Eurocentric, Americanocentric narrative, IR as a field or international studies as a field not only misses out the richness of uh, the experience of the world in its, all its diversity, but also fails to provide good explanations, good understanding, adequate and understanding of what actually is happening in the world because uh, the vast majority of the people and the states and societies in the world don't live in the West, uh, don't belong to the West. So if we don't make them heard, or uh, if you don't address them as actors, as contributors, then the field is not really truly not international, it's certainly not global. So with that, let me welcome our uh, speakers today. I am going to, uh, uh, with my agreement from my colleague Patrick, uh, I'm going to uh, invite uh, the furthest, the first, uh, the speaker who came from furthest from New Delhi. So that would be uh, Deepsika Shahi, who is uh, uh, from Delhi University. Uh, and uh, while a lot of other scholars we have had on this panel have uh, talked about global IR and uh, spoken about global IR, she actually has written about global IR, including two books uh, using global IR as uh, a analytical uh, device. So this is very important to hear from her. What is, uh, why did she decide to write uh, these books and why did she decide to use global IR and not just realism or liberalism or constructivism? Uh, the next speaker will be Nora Fisher Onar from uh, University of San Francisco. Um, and Nora is uh, uh, about to publish a book with Cambridge uh, and uh, she uh, looks at uh, in a sense, global history, Eurasia, global history, and also IR. And she can talk about her own take on global IR. I have worked with her over the past couple of years, uh, developing some ideas. And I've just gave a talk on global IR to her program. And last but not the least, Jack Snyder, the person I know the best and the longest uh, in this uh, uh, list of speakers. And I personally owe a good deal to Jack because I, in my early career years, I really didn't publish anything without Jack's approval or saying that it's okay, you will get criticized, but it's, it's good and gave me a lot of comments. Uh, and I really appreciate that um, because you can see that a global IR doesn't exclude even realists. Uh, okay, we, there are good realists and bad ones. And, uh, and we have a very, very uh, good friend of mine and uh, somebody who is uh, really broad inclusive and also willing to engage uh, new theories, new ideas and new concepts. So, but I'll give him the last slot because he is only from New York. Um, so with that, I will open this up. If all of you have 10 minutes uh, of opening remarks and then you will get a chance to address Q and A. And Patrick, I'll leave it to you whether we need a uh, leg break, or a five minute break somewhere. Otherwise we'll, uh, Dipsika, you are the first. Go ahead. All right. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank Amitabh 
and Patrick for organizing this much needed dialogue on global IR. This dialogue is much needed, not just because the Eurocentric neoliberal world order is declining, as Cameron Thies had rightly pointed out. And against that backdrop, global IR seems to be emerging as a more open, inclusive, and promising research agenda. But also because the once embryonic research agenda of global IR is now undergoing an unprecedented phase of advancement, a phase of advancement which is not surprisingly marked with a range of internal tensions. I'm glad that the honorable speakers of previous sessions have immaculately foregrounded those internal tensions. And in my 10 minute presentation today, I'll try to explain how those tensions have been dealt with in some recent works on global IR, including my two books, first, Advaita as a global international relations theory, and second, Sufism, a theoretical intervention in global international relations. Broadly speaking, the ongoing dialogue pinpointed three internal tensions in global IR. First, is global IR a theory? Or is it just a vehicle to push the existing critical theoretical traditions of Eurocentric IR or post-colonial traditions of non-Eurocentric IR? Second, if global IR is a theory, then should this theory generate little pictures or big pictures? And third, if global IR theory includes both little and big pictures, then how would it be possible to reconcile the particularity of local little pictures with the universality of global big pictures? In what follows, I'll try to respond to each of these questions in a sequential manner. Now, Amitabh said that global IR is not a theory, but then he warned that global IR is concerned with where you get your theory from. I presume he meant to say that global IR is not a single theory, but it includes multiplicity of theories and concepts that have diverse local origins. Here I want to add that technically speaking, all theories, Eurocentric or non-Eurocentric have local origins. However, the local origins do not essentially undermine the ability of theories to decode global realities. Lately, the non-Western parts of the globe have borrowed from their local philosophical heritage to design several theories and concepts that seek to decode the global realities. For instance, Tianxia, or the notion of all under heaven from China. Advaita, literally meaning non-duality from India. Baso ostinato, which means recurrent underlying motif from Japan. Dhigra takrar and tawal, meaning repetition, lack of repetition and interpretation from Turkey. And ubantu, meaning collective personhood from Africa among others. Though these theorizations have local origins, it would be misleading to assume that global IR draws from a national history or culture for the sake of sustaining a nationalist or nativist plan. Such misleading views are found in the writings of some scholars, such as Audrey Alessandro, for whom global IR is always nationalist. I think such views are incorrect. I think so because my first book on global IR employs the Indian philosophy of Advaita, but it employs Advaita to create universally applicable theoretical discourses. And my second book on global IR is based on Sufism, a philosophy which is not even restrictively tied up to a specific national, national history or culture. But then, in order to establish itself as a progressive research program in Lakatoshian sense, global IR must explicitly identify its conceptual, epistemological, and methodological contents. In this context, I fully empathize with the apprehensions expressed by Michael Barnett about how global IR must build a research program that is not just oppositional, but relational, not just normative, but also intellectual. Now, the question is, can we affirm that the present works on global IR at least make an attempt to offer such a relational intellectual research program? The answer is yes. The attempt to build a relational intellectual research program of global IR springs from the conceptual core of one and many, not one or many, but one and many. 
On the basis of my previous research, I have come to realize that many prevailing non-Western perspectives on global world order endorse a non-essentialist epistemology of monism, one world, without compromising with the ontology of pluralism, many worlds. That is to say, the real-time notion of one and many. We simultaneously, concurrently live in one and many worlds. Unlike the Kantian view that manufactures a superficial phenomena-nomena divide or science metaphysics divide, which in turn constructs split identities. And here I agree with Randolph Persad that IR is about management of identities. The Indian philosophy of Advaita asserts that the subjective manyness of world in appearance, phenomena, and the objective oneness of world in itself, nomena, are not two mutually disjointed existential zones. Phenomena and nomena are two distinct cognitive zones of the same time space indivisibility that defines the connectedness of the entire globe. Similarly, Roger Ames argues that the one many problematic is a core Western philosophical concern. It is however not important in shaping the Chinese philosophical tradition. Rather than debating the one many problematic or whole part relations, the Chinese philosophical tradition focuses upon part part relations, wherein the societal, political, and even cosmic orders are immanental, coterminous, and mutually entailing. Also, the Japanese doctrine of interpenetration between one and many upholds that the structure of the aesthetic continuum of nature is a web of relationships where all things are interdependent. In a way, the conceptual core of one and many supplies a three-dimensional vision of global realities, wherein the identities of diverse self and others living in a pluriverse remain varyingly yet continually subsumed in each other via a third dimension that is nomina. LHM Ling explains the Chinese Taoist trialectics, and I have tried to explore the Indian Advaitic trialectics as a methodology that goes beyond Hegelian dialectics in, investing, in, in investigating the three-dimensional vision of global reality. I believe the existing literature on global IR already indicates a preliminary research program. And therefore, one can safely state that global IR is not about reinventing the wheel. While the dualist Kantian or neo-Kantian theoretical traditions of IR, including post-colonial and decolonial IR, consider the distinctiveness of human beings as irreconcilable at the level of identity, the intellectual base of global IR, riding on the notion of one and many, suggests that the realm of the international is a fusion of phenomena, that is visible self other distinction and nomina that is invisible oneness. And it is humanly possible to reconcile visible self other distinctions with invisible oneness. Of course, the research program of Global IR can be used to generate and find complementarities between various little and big pictures. I support the insights shared by Cynthia and Law and Jane Tickner that the inductive strategy to begin with particular local little pictures can productively enhance the complexity of universal global big pictures. But then from the standpoint of global IR, the deductive strategy to make big pictures or grand theories holds specific significance, especially because of the highly racist colonial division of human groups into human tasks and anthropos. Traditionally, a few European intellectuals regarded themselves as an exceptional kind of humanity capable of theory. And they call themselves humanitas. And in, they, argued this in opposition to other non-European kinds of humanity, namely anthropos who produce knowledge, but were declared incapable to reflect upon or criticize their modus operandi in knowledge production. One is reminded of Edmund Husserl's hierarchical differentiation, whereby Greek European science projected as philosophical theoretical knowledge was considered superior to oriental practical attitude reduced to empirical anthropological type. For Husserl, the English dominions, the United States and the like clearly belong to Europe. Whereas the Eskimos or Indians presented as curiosities at fairs or the gypsies who wandered about Europe did not. Alarmingly, this hierarchical differentiation is antithetical to the key features of globality of IR as highlighted by John Hobson in his forthcoming book. I know about it because I have contributed a chapter to it. Those three key features of globality of IR are diversity, acceptance of epistemological variety, 
agency, appreciation of theoretical performativity and pluriversality, that is acknowledgement of plural particularist as well as universalist perspectives. I think the politics of knowledge was imposed by the West on the non-West in a binary fashion. However, a conscientious pursuit of global IR today calls for a fresh politics of knowledge wherein an effective West-non-West dialogue cautiously plays out on non-binary or say non retaliatory terms and conditions. I think I'll stop here and I'm willing to take questions on pedagogy and uh, publications and further rounds of discussion. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dipsika. You not only gave us some uh, of your own ideas about what global IR is or isn't, but you also very nicely summed up the discussion of the previous two dialogues by citing so many of our speakers, uh, like Anne Pickner or uh, Cynthia Anlo and uh, Michael Barnett and, uh, and others. So, so uh, you know, next time I'm in Delhi, I don't know when that will be, I will take you out to a nice dinner in Karim's in Chandan Chok. So I hope that restaurant has not disappeared. But thank you very much. We will have questions for you. Um, I will now move to Nora, Nora fisher Onar from uh, University of San Francisco. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, to uh, Dipshika for this uh, um, tour de force. Um, and it is such a pleasure to uh, watch you in action and perform after having assigned your work to uh, my graduate students, um, who likewise uh, are thrilled by the um, revelations that your, your written work inspires. Um, but I also want to turn and um, express my heartfelt thanks to the organizers, Dr. Acharya and Dr. Jackson, and the School of International Service at American University for pulling these sessions together. It's really an extraordinary opportunity which you have created for all of us, speakers and participants alike, who have been grounded, as it were, for over a year to engage creatively, in real time, across a vast geography, and with people who have been bona fide intellectual inspirations. So you have my sincere gratitude. And to this end of creative engagement, I've sought to wrap my mind around the question you posed. How do changes in world order affect international relations and international studies? And how do such changes limit or open spaces for new voices, theories, and methods? And my answer to this is going to echo some of the um, comments that Dr. Acharya made in his uh, framing remarks. Now, that answer for me is in part um, common sense, and it's part an attempt to align my reading of the disciplinary trajectory of global IR with our evolving zeitgeist. Because in my humble view, the common sense part, there has always been an analytical as well as normative need to decenter and pluralize IR long before the, the coining of the term global IR or coalescing of the project in the past decade. This analytical as well as normative need dates back at the very least to the period of formal decolonization in the 1950s and 1960s, which of course were also foundational years for the emergence of IR as a discipline. It retained distinctly colonial traits in both its realist and its liberal variants, traits which blinded IR scholars and practitioners alike to important phenomena beyond the West. And I keep emphasizing the analytical as well as normative need for a globalized approach because there would have been real practical benefits to taking on board the frankly intuitive fact that there are multiple ways of being and doing in this world. This should have been apparent from the get-go. This utility can be illustrated by two contrasts and examples of US performance during the Cold War. On one hand, for instance, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, President Kennedy actually listened to the area expert in the room, the former ambassador to Moscow, who had had intimate encounters with the non-Western other, namely the Khrushchevs and the Soviet Union, and thus understood the performative nature of um, Khrushchev's escalationism for the Soviet premier's domestic audiences. Kennedy, by thus following a thick and inductive account of Soviet reasoning, instead of heeding the US-centric and deductive arguments of offensive realist General LeMay, managed to literally prevent mutually assured destruction. This outcome can be contrasted with, say, America's expansion into Vietnam, which as then Secretary of State Robert McNamara later realized might have been avoided if only Washington had taken seriously the historical and cultural sources of Vietnamese resistance as anti-colonial struggle against sovereign erasure, and thus an existential fight unlikely to dissipate in the face of mere if formidable firepower, absent a comparable existential commitment on the part of US combatants. And had this realization occurred at the time, as McNamara later lamented, millions of lives, mostly but by no means only Vietnamese, and a great deal of treasure, mostly but by no means only American, could have been salvaged. 
Yet, as recently as 2013, when Calypso Nikolaitis and I published our call to decenter the European Union's international relations in tune with post-colonial critique in an article for Cooperation and Conflict, the analytical come practical benefits of decentering were dismissed by many of our interlocutors at conferences, for example, as hypernormative and unrealistic because the strong and the wealthy will always dominate the weak and the poor and there's nothing to be done about it except for the weak and the poor to devise coping strategies. But fast forward less than a decade, and I would argue that we now find ourselves in a sweet spot from a global IR perspective, in that analytical and practical benefits, as well as the normative imperative of decentering, have now aligned with geopolitical and geoeconomic realities. So what I'll do with my remaining time is to briefly explain why ontologically, epistemologically, and methodologically, as well as prescriptively, I believe the time is right for global IR, and then I'll turn to some specific thematic areas which may offer pathways for global IR's evolution. Um, and in this regard, I'm going to be more kind of anecdotal and personalistic, um, uh, which seems fitting um, following the masterful uh, theoretical overview which Professor Shah has, has given us. Now, for starters, it's just really not rocket science to recognize that we live in a world of multiple actors and institutions, processes and cultures. Classical realists and diplomatic historians do this well, even if their studies were steeped in myriad other forms of Eurocentric erasure of actual lived diversity. But Waltzian parsimony and the narrowing of our epistemological vision do first the behavioralism and then the neorealist neoliberal concert killed appreciation for real world complexity in the IR Academy in ways that many more August figures than myself believe has been counterproductive to our discipline because theoretical elegance has come at the price of relevance to the actual conduct of international affairs. Now, generationally, I'm not positioned to speak in depth to, nor do I wish to get bogged down in these debates. But I can affirm that as a graduate student in the late 2000s, I was stifled by the main paradigms, which didn't help me to shed light on the problems that I found interesting as an Iranian born, China and Japan raised, transatlantic trained, and Turkey based woman at that time observing world affairs. These were problems relevant to the role of history and memory of Western colonialism to be sure, but also of Eurasia's erstwhile empires, the Ottomans, the Persians, the Russians and the Chinese, and the uses and abuses of these histories in present day political projects and geocultural aspirations, as well as the implications of these reemergent geocultural imaginaries for vulnerable groups across the Eurasian space from women to ethnic and religious minorities. But until Global IR came along and offered a disciplinary space within which to situate my questions and pursue my answers. I drew on Dr. Snyder and Jervis's great work on complexity and Katzenstein and Sills on analytical eclecticism, which helped to begin carving out the ontological, epistemological and methodological space I needed to address the phenomena in which I and many people like me situated in Istanbul or Shanghai were interested. But honestly, it was quite a lonely space and not one that found a lot of uptake with IR publishers. So I basically found refuge in interdisciplinary area studies, which allowed me to pursue these problem-driven queries, albeit sequestered from disciplinary IR. But in the meantime, the economic momentum of the emerging powers in the 2000s, in, ta in tandem with the US subprime mortgage crisis and the Eurozone crises at the end of the decade, had unleashed anxieties and energies which were augmenting disciplinary and professional interest in the non-West as evidenced by the cascade of major publication on the cusp of the 2010s. I'm thinking of course of Acharya Buzan, Tickner and Weber, and Naik and Salvin on the Centre and IR, um, and the concomitant number of workshops and conferences that proliferated on the rise of the rest and the BRICS um, in the global North as well as the global South. Um, and so I began to have hope reading these books, engaging these conversations, which brought me to my first International Studies Association conference, which uh, Dr. Jackson alluded to in his introduction uh, in New Orleans. I think it was the year was 2014 or 15, um, uh, which is the year of Dr. Acharya's presidency. And my jaw hit the floor because I realized that I was not alone in my quest for a decentered interdisciplinary space with an IR. So while the hype, as Aisha's article puts it, over the BRICS per se has dis dissipated by the end of the 2000s, China's arc and the ever more disruptive revisionism of other actors across the Eurasian space that I attend to, like Russia and Turkey, in tandem with the attenuation of Western soft power and global engagement under Trump, especially these past six to 12 months during the pandemic, have meant, as we lean into the 2020s, that multiplexity, to use Amitabh's felicitous phrase, is well underway and clearly evident 
to many observers around the globe. So at long last, the analytical come practical and normative need to decenter IR is matching up with the structural pressures of our age. And global IR is indeed flourishing as a broad tent where folks from international historical sociology, critical feminist and post-colonial decolonial IR theory and interdisciplinary area studies can have a conversation about the subjects that we believe in a problem-driven fashion based on our own positionalities within the discipline and the physical world need to be addressed. So when it comes to growth areas for global IR, I see at least five promising pathways and I'll, be, I'll briefly gesture to these and uh, leave space to discuss them further in the, um, uh, in the conversation that will follow. Um, number one area for growth, um, I do believe that the ontological attention to complexity enabled by global IR means that there's ample scope for conversation between complex systems thinking and global IR. In my own forthcoming monograph on Turkey, for example, which Dr. Chare kindly introduced, I propose a pared down version of the complexity apparatus to provide a framework which non-Western scholars could use to upload their thick knowledge of non-Western complexity as a basis for comparison of evolving political systems and thereby offer a framework which eschews the binary a priori orientalist and Eurocentric logic that characterized so much IR engagement of the non West. Uh, the non -West. I can speak to this more in the Q&A. Number two growth area. This is relationality and the relational turn and the discipline is a cognate complexifying move that I find incredibly promising as a site for coordinating conversations. But since we have Dr. Shai and Dr. Jackson as well in the room who have published extensively on this, I will, I, I will defer to their elaboration of the promise of the relational turn. Number three, I think we can be more strategic in forging the connection with folks who work on history and memory, like myself, thanks to Global IR's emphasis on the importance of multiple and not only Western historical sources for understanding international order. Um, in this sense, I also think I, uh, this, this, this um, demand uh, in IR is a growth industry attested to by the um, uh, flourishing um, of uh, cultural production in the more popular cultural industries recently. Thinking of, for example, Hamilton or Bridgerton, um, uh, sort of el elaborate productions which attest to the growing demand that we revisit our past in ways which recover the stories and voices of marginalized actors in official histories. Women, girls, gender minorities, people of color, working classes, and other subaltern characters, so as to write the present and the future in more inclusive ways. Number four, I think there's scope for a fruitful conversation between global IR and comparative area studies, an emerging field where currently excellent work is underway, situated mostly in comparative politics and in a positive stadium, which is fine because global IR is a broad tent and um, uh, many of us within the field do speak the language of causality, myself included. Finally, number five, global IR and foreign policy analysis. Because as I've been arguing, um, echoing Dr. Acharya's framing remarks at the beginning of this uh, uh, panel, um, the recognition of complexity and relationality across world regions is ultimately a boon to practitioners seeking to navigate a multiplex world of plural modernities that persistent and dynamic interconnections. So I realized these five areas were just teases, but I'll leave it at that and can we it can reprise any of these themes as desired during the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nora. We'll come. Amitav, you're actually muted. I, I don't I don't know how that happened. Okay, yeah. Um, I was uh, thanking Nora for uh, bringing uh, up those five uh, growth areas of global IR, and this is exactly the kind of helpful intervention that we were expecting to come out of these dialogues. It's not just about uh, criticizing what happened uh, to IR or where IR is uh, that we all know about, but how we can take it from here to the future. And how can we build something that is uh, genuinely um, global or whatever you call it? So those are very helpful comments and we'll uh, probe you more on that uh, later uh, during Q&A. So now let, let me just move to uh, Jack Snyder. Jack. 
Well, thanks so much for uh, giving me the chance to get up to speed on uh, the latest developments in global IR, which is obviously um, a very dynamic and interesting uh, field of endeavor in our, in our business. Uh, so the questions that were posed that we were asked to respond to were um, like big and difficult and they made my head hurt thinking about what I was going to say. So I decided to do something that was going to be easier for me, which is an inductive exercise uh, talking you through uh, the syllabus works for my class that I'm going to teach this afternoon uh, to my Columbia College undergraduate seminar in international security. And, uh, but, and so I'm going to uh, really not characterize what I'm doing vis-a-vis -vis global IR and so forth. I'm just gonna tell you what we're doing and then you can tell me whether what I'm doing is global IR and how it can be approved you know, by the, the yardstick of global IR uh, objectives. So um, the topic, uh, is also completely coincidentally a topic that I was invited to a conference by Amitavacharya on a few years ago, uh, namely the question of multiple modernities, um, whether it is possible to have more than one form of modernity and uh, to what extent the different forms of uh, modernities map on to culturally uh, different civilizations or regions. Uh, the, uh, the other theme of the readings for the class are uh, regional international systems and comparing um, the way uh, international politics plays out in different regions of the world, but also different regions in different historical uh, periods. It's a kind of comparative anarchies exercise. Um, the comparative anar anarchies has been on my IR theory reading list for the grad students uh, for 30 years. So that part is not new. The multiple modernities question arose uh, really as the result of a kind of contemporary politics debate. Uh, people, you know, kept saying that oh, Frank Fukuyama was wrong. Uh, it's not true that all authoritarian styles of modernity are temporary flashes in the pan, soon to head into the dustbin of history. China is different. China is a sustainable, high technology, technocratic, uh, self-sustaining growth form of modernity. It's just not a liberal one. So that part is more uh, contemporary in its motivation for me. So let me tell you what I assign. So the required readings for this afternoon, I'm not saying they actually will have read them, but they're supposed to have read Peter Katzenstein, Civilizations in World Politics, chapter one, which as you may know, he's arguing, yes, there are and will be multiple modernities and they map onto civilizational uh, differences, including cultural dimensions of civilization. Uh, then I'm also having them read the work that inspired Katzenstein's thinking about multiple modernities, namely the essay by Shmuel Eisenstadt in uh, Daedalus Winter of 2000, which you may remember uh, talks about the uh, 
axial civilizations that resulted from the great salvation religions emergence uh, 2000 years ago and how they created different paths of uh, social development that once you hit modernity, uh, modernity had some common features in all of them, but they developed in um, ways that were, you know, importantly distinct, creating the, uh, the pattern of multiple modernities. The other required reading is uh, Charlie Kupchin's uh, article uh, on normative foundations of hegemony and the coming challenge to Pax Americana it was the one that was in security studies in 2014, where he, uh, looked around the world and said, you know, there are places like China, there's the legacy of the Ottoman Empire and various other places that just were not fitting in well with the institutional structures and the cultural understandings of American liberalism and that it was going to become increasingly hard for the U.S to uh, sell the spread of its brand of hegemony. Uh, and then uh, I asked them to read any one of a pretty long list of uh, readings on specific regions of their choice of interest to them. And uh, yes, uh, this is Eurocentric in the sense that there are more readings on the origins of the European uh, state system than any other topic on here. Uh, I've got, uh, you know, they can choose from uh, Charles Tilley, War Made the State and the State Made War, uh, Hendrik Freud's sovereign state and its competitors, which is eclectic about coalitions in, inside uh, societies uh, and the building of institutions and also their interaction in a kind of political and cultural system. Um, I have Dan Nexon, The Struggle for Power in Early Modern Europe, which as you know, is about uh, the Protestant Reformation and how it reshaped um, the identity categories and social networks of early modern Europe in order to move from the age of medieval uh, forms of governance, including empires, city-states, and whatnot to uh, the sovereign state, uh, territorial state model. And uh, so I do this because, you know, this is after all the sovereign state model that dominates the international system. So it's intrinsically important, but I also do it to set up the really terrific uh, work of Victoria Tinbor Hui, uh, who was my PhD student when she started on her project of uh, the Chinese warring states. Um, and uh, she, so uh, her argument in this book uh, of hers, or what eventually became her prize winning book, War and State Formation in Ancient China and Early Modern Europe, uh, she's asking the question, well, why did the balance of power um, run to uh, empire in China, whereas uh, the anarchical balance of power system in Europe stayed in place uh, through 19, uh, you know, pick, pick, pick your date uh, uh, forever, or maybe you think the EU has uh, superseded the balance of power system in Europe, but in any case, and uh, her argument, interestingly enough, is that China differed from Europe um, because of its pattern of state building, that uh, Chinese state building was 
uh, more effective in designing state strengthening institutions than Europe had been doing stupid things uh, like using mercenaries, which only weakened the state. But also interestingly enough and kind of ironically, uh, she says that um, the state of Qin was able to roll up the system in ancient China because um, they were better at using Machiavellian tactics of political manipulation to divide and rule and undermine their adversaries. Uh, so her argument, interestingly enough, is that China was actually better at doing what European states are famously known for doing in, in their own um, you know, self-mythology. Uh, I also assigned uh, Amitav's famous article, How Ideas Spread, Whose Norms uh, Matter, about uh, ASEAN and Asian uh, realism. But I juxtapose that against uh, Krasner's uh, writing on sovereignty. Again, the uh, irony being that uh, the ASEAN states are in some ways um, not just copying uh, the, the sovereign states system of Europe, but in some ways figuring out ways to actually do it better or at least better adapted to their own circumstances. Uh, I also have uh, Edel Solingen talking about regional orders um, at centuries dawn with the, uh, the importance of internationalist and national nationalist uh, domestic coalitions with a bunch of Middle East cases. And I also have Amitav's debate with David Kang on whether there's a kind of a China centric tribute hegemonic system emerging in East Asia, or whether, no, no, uh, the smaller states are balancing and pushing back against that, and that that uh, cultural history uh, should not be kind of just mindlessly applied to the future in circumstances that are very different. Um, just. I told you that I was not going to have any take homes from this description of what I'm doing. But uh, let me just say a couple of things. I did not pick things um, thinking of global IR. I did not pick uh, writing or authors in order to be inclusive in any way. I was just thinking of my students and what would help them do an interesting term paper. Uh, and then my one substantive take home is, uh, as you can see from the way I talked about the supplementary list, uh, for me, the take home is that a lot of the examples that are not Europe were examples of uh, states and actors playing the game in a smart, realist way, and in some ways doing that better than the Europeans that we think of as having invented the balance of power system. So uh, I'm looking forward to having you uh, tell me whether I'm doing global IR or doing a travesty against it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Jack. And um, we will uh, begin our uh, discussions momentarily. You can start putting questions uh, on the, I guess, uh, chat that Patrick is going to monitor. I want to raise a few uh, questions for each of you, or one question at least for each of you, so that we can get a discussion or a dialogue going. And these questions can be addressed by each of you or any of you. Uh, the first thing is uh, what uh, Dipsika said um, or claimed uh, is that uh, even though global IR was not supposed to be a theory, it has developed a research agenda. And she provides the best example of that, having done two books uh, on, uh, on this topic. 
And uh, so drawing on that experience, I would like to ask not only her, but others as well, uh, that uh, what sort of research agenda we can get out of this, uh, of global IR. What are the, well, Nora talked about five next steps, uh, which is very, very, very insightful, very useful, but I'd like to also ask Jack, and Dipsika, uh, they also agree with that. Uh, just give us your views on what could be a research agenda that moves IR away a little bit from Eurocentrism or Americanocentrism uh, and makes it uh, you know, broader. I mean, we don't have to call it global IR, but certainly make it broader. Uh, and then I move to Jack in this context. Uh, everything you said about your course, by the way, and thank you for including some of my readings, they seem to me to be perfectly compatible with what we are trying to do in global IR. Uh, so, so multiple modernities as a very much uh, a part of a global IR and the multiplex uh, <clears throat> world order. Regions are absolutely critical. It's the point three or four of the six points I make about global IR. I started as an area specialist, very proud of it, of Southeast Asia and moved to IR. And uh, thanks to, by the way, your and Peter Kazenstein's en encouragement. Uh, and uh, and uh, I think a re a regional orders, a regional uh, socialization uh, from a constructivist perspective, very important. Uh, regional institutions uh, are pretty much part of global IR. Uh, the only thing I would uh, like to say is that uh, perhaps less of uh, uh, Acharya and Hui and more of the original writings uh, from those regions. Uh, there is a bunch of writing coming from uh, uh, people like, uh, I think you have written about some of that, the Chinese scholars, the Chinese scholars mm -hmm. school of Yan Sui Tong, his Princeton book, uh, Chin Ya Chin's uh, Cambridge book. Uh, so listen to uh, probably have some of their readings. In my course, I am I'm including their writings and Patrick knows some of these because they, uh, the, uh, the, uh, at least Chin's writing relates to relationality, which is one of the also areas that Nora uh, wants to uh, global IR to go. Uh, so that's the only thing I say. I'm very familiar with Victoria's work. Um, in fact, it's excellent. Uh, and, uh, and I think I the only thing I would say is that uh, when you say Asians are copying or uh, adapting, those are very different things. Uh, so adapting is very different from copying. Uh, that's why I talk about localization, where local agency makes it more important. And you also say, uh, that uh, uh, the, uh, the Chin unification was very Machiavellian. Uh, well, I mean, Chin unification came thousand years before Machiavelli, didn't he? I mean, more than thousand, thousand five hundred, uh, more than that. Uh, so maybe Machiavelli was following Chin unification strategy. Uh, and this is a matter of language and context. I mean, really, there's a lot more commonality than we assume, except that the language we use, the context and the concepts we use, we seem to think they all come from the West. Uh, I did a comparative study once of uh, 10 key concepts in IR, including norms, including sovereignty, including state, and uh, almost all of them came from either Greek, Latin, via medieval French. So, but that doesn't mean they were invented in Greece. Or, uh, they were invented in maybe China, but Chinese did not have a, um, access to the ling English language to put it on the map. So global IR also looks at the linguistic dimensions of how the hegemony of the West is partly a misleadingly linguistic hegemony. Just because there are words, just because democracy came from Greece or Greek doesn't make Athens a true democracy. Uh, you know, all these things have other multiple global origins. That's a key argument of global IR. So that's why multiple modernities does help. Uh, quite a bit. But anyway, just to say that, I'd like to hear from you, uh, you the fact that you are doing this uh, is, uh, is, is great. And that's to me al already resonates with global IR. The second question to all of you is that uh, this is a really a, a, a problem with uh, people relating to global IR. Uh, this is a relatively new idea. It's not very popular uh, in the curriculum of uh, Western universities. So there's a fear factor. So a lot of graduate students, especially PhD students ask me, that said, are we going to get a job doing global IR? Now uh, we have a generation of uh, different generations of scholars in the panel. And uh, of course we have uh, Dipshika and Nora uh, belonging to a 
younger generation who may still have memories of their own PhDs. Uh, and Jack, you are a very uh, senior scholar. We, you have supervised more PhDs than, uh, uh, you know, um, I have written articles. Uh, so, so would you have any advice for, uh, like drawing on that part of the course that you described to us in such detail, uh, what kind of research agenda might come out of this? that we can also embrace as part of Global IR because Global IR keeps very open mind about uh, methodology and uh, epistemology and uh, how you do it. Uh, how, but any specific thoughts on this would be good. And I'd also like to ask this same question to Nora and Dipsika from their own experience of writing on this topic. Did they have uh, any fear? Did they have any concern? Did they have really care about the Western IR theory? Uh, finally, uh, a point about uh, uh, obstacles. Uh, well, I already mentioned the fear factor as one of the obstacles of people getting in. But uh, if uh, you want to think about what is the single most important, or maybe two most important barriers to broadening the IR discourse. There are some people like John Mearsheimer who argue that uh, there's no need to change anything. Uh, he wrote an article with the title for my special issue as a presidential issue, uh, American hegemony in IR is benign. He called it benign hegemony. Do you think there is any need to change anything? Or is it a benign hegemony? I can expect some answers from uh, you, but it will be good to hear it from you in your own words. So I will go to uh, the order in which people spoke. Dipsika, just take a couple of minutes, uh, which, whichever you want to address, before we open it up to the audience. All right, I'll try to respond to as many questions as I can. Uh, talking about the research agenda, um, I feel uh, one of the main problems of the conventional academic discipline of international relations is geocentrism. Uh, whenever a theory arises, we try to look into the source, the geographical source of it. So. Uh, I think that kind of a research agenda would do better for global IR, where we not only talk about centrisms, but also how hypothetically at least, or at the level of imagination, we can talk about non-centric centric theories or uh, non-centric practices of uh, doing IR. And there I think, the concept of nowhere or nothingness plays a very crucial role. I was listening to the speakers who uh, participated in uh, previous sessions and it, a point came out that we all come from somewhere and that somewhere is very important. But then the question that comes to my mind is even when we come from somewhere, do we not, not uh, remain connected uh, in such a way that the differences between some wares is less important than the similarities. So I think a uh, global IR research agenda should try to theoretically as well as practically highlight the complementarities and similarities, not just the differences. And for that, we need to look inward, not just outward. Inward By inward, I mean penetrating different levels of consciousness. There's a whole lot of discourse, uh, philosophical as well as theoretical, that exists on uh, the study of consciousness, but we have not employed those discourses in formal IR uh, discipline. And uh, when I did uh, my research, when I studied uh, uh, consciousness, by the way, uh, Alexander Wendt has recently worked a lot on consciousness and he talks about panpsychism and so on. And there I see overlaps and similarities. But when we look inward, when we try to penetrate different levels of consciousness, we realize that the fact is that we come from somewhere, yet there is a nothingness, a nowhere, uh, which always lies uh, underlying our visible differences. Uh, and when we take that kind of a theoretical discourse coming from global IR, it means that globalization is not uh, something which happened just because uh, of the technical uh, interventions that led to compression of time and space. It's just about realizing who we are as human beings, our ability as human beings to go within us. If we do that, then 
the outcome that comes to my mind is that international or not, being human is being global. So I think this is a very distinctive research agenda and Global IR should uh, go ahead with that. But at the same time, I feel that the theory science sounds good, but we also need to substantiate these kinds of theoretical discourses in terms of policy implications. Talking about the fear factor, I don't think there would be a problem in finding jobs because I keep looking uh, for the openings and many a times it's highlighted even by the Western universities that they're looking for someone who specializes in non-Western or post-Western or uh, global IR. So uh, job finding should not be difficult just because you are doing global IR. But personally speaking, whether there was a fear factor that I faced when I was trying to write on global IR, frankly speaking, I never uh, thought about uh, any fear or I didn't uh, practice my knowledge building exercise because I wanted my knowledge building exercise to result into an outcome, a profitable outcome. Uh, it was just uh, about expressing myself. And I think it's very important because since we have had a uh, uh, postmodernism, we always talk about knowledge power nexus, but we need to talk about how practicing knowledge is important just for gaining knowledge, for spreading knowledge, not because we necessarily want to uh, necessarily want to uh, politicize or gain some political uh, uh, footage. Um, what needs to change? Uh, of course, uh, benign or not, hegemony is not acceptable. So every effort uh, that comes uh, forward, which tries to uh, make the discipline or the practice of IR non-hegemonic is always welcome. That's it. Thanks. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Nora, can you uh, address any point you want to address in a couple of minutes? Uh, I don't know. Yes. Um... And uh, thank you for these uh, these really helpful prompts uh, to kind of think through the implications um, of what we've been discussing. Um, in terms of this, the research agenda, you know, I had identified kind of five areas that I see as promising sites for developing a sort of a structured and sort of strategic conversation with global IR. Um, so, so complexity thinking, history memory, relationality, uh, area studies and foreign policy analysis, and there's not enough time to go over all of them. And my thinking on uh, these different fronts is, you know, more or less developed vis-a-vis um, -vis uh, different uh, different headings. Um, but I'll speak to the complexity one because that's the one that is most salient in my mind right now as I wrap up my uh, manuscript revisions um, for my forthcoming book. Um, and the reason why I think complexity is particularly promising because it's another flourishing community um, within IR that also has. Uh, even more sort of um, uh, resonance uh, in uh, adjacent disciplines in the social sciences and management sciences and even the natural sciences. So there's already sort of a very strong sort of critical mass of people who are working from complexity uh, perspectives. Um, uh, and what's so fascinating about complexity and, and complex systems thinking is that um, it allows us epistemologically and methodologically to set up inquiry in ways that default, um, you know, by default, fault do not subscribe to Eurocentric binaries. Um, so in the case of my work on Turkey, for example, which is what my book is about, um, I'm able to, um, I believe, uh, debunk um, a lot of reductionist explanations of what happens in Turkey as a, as a sort of, um, you know, the, the common Eurocentric reading in the West, Orientalist reading in the West, is that everything that happens in Turkey is the product of some sort of inexorable primordial conflict between Islamists and secularists, and this has always been the case and always been the case. Um, and this is really kind of the a priori um, uh, projection of Western Orientalist expectations about what Islamic political actors look like and do, um, and secular political actors look like and do, that really obscures a lot of the complexity of foot on the ground that actually drives palpable outcomes um, in both the country's politics and its foreign policy. Um, and so by setting up my inquiry to, um, uh, to be off operationalized through a complex systems logic and analytical narrative sort of uh, vocabulary, um, I'm able to tell a revisionist story uh, that, um, that, that uh, debunks what I think is a, is a pernicious uh, Eurocentric myth when it comes to uh, analyzing the politics and foreign policies of the Islamicate world. Um, and it's one that aligns with also uh, historical sociology, you know, the historical sociologists and institutionalists um, use a lot of complexity uh, reasoning um, 
um, uh, and, and the sort of the analytical apparatus of sort of path dependence, continuity, rupture, critical junctures, um, uh, the emergence, um, the interplay of system parameters. Uh, these are all sort of, this, this provides kind of a, a vocabulary and an apparatus that allows um, uh, folks who are not necessarily um, embedded or um, have not say heard of global IR to engage with globalized scholars and non-Western scholars um, through kind of an overlapping um, vocabulary and epistemological orientation um, that I think would be fruitful uh, to further develop. And there are people in, in global IR who have um, pursued complexity approaches. I mean, Kavaski has made the case for it. Um, a lot of people working on environmental questions uh, in global IR have made the case for it. Um, and there's certainly an abundance of, of panels at uh, ISA and APSA, um, IR-oriented panels that uh, draw on complexity logics, but I don't think anyone has really sort of explicitly forged the global IR complexity connection. So I see that as a very um, fruitful pathway moving forward. Um, it's also one that allays a bit the fear factor um, that you mentioned, because um, when one speaks to logic of complexity, you can talk about uh, necessary and sufficient mechanisms, causality, um, and you can kind of speak an explanatory language that at least the North American job market is more receptive to. Um, and I know as someone who uh, recently, you know, quite recently uh, underwent a job search in the North American job market. Um, it is, uh, at least in my experience, not as rosy a picture as uh, Dushka uh, suggested. And there are a lot of um, institutional uh, barriers towards uptake of this type of work, in at least in politics and IR departments. Um, and that's why I'm uh, very grateful to have found a position with an interdisciplinary international studies where there seems to be um, a little bit less of a, um, a resistance to the type of um, analytical eclecticism, methodological pluralism that many global IR scholars bring to the table. Um, so in that sense, um, although I consider myself to be an IR scholar, I have found my disciplinary home in international studies, not in international relations per se, um, at my institution, um, because that's where there was, that, that, that's where there was a friendly space. Um, on um, uh, just, to, I just wanted to quickly respond also kind of linking um, uh, Dr. Achai's questions to um, Dr. Snyder's uh, syllabus, which I found fascinating. Um, you know, I really thought uh, it was interesting the way that you um, lined up uh, uh, pieces that, you know, I myself would assign if I was teaching um, the historical uh, em uh, emergence of international orders and, um, you know, different pathways to state formation and uh, empire uh, building um, historically, but I kind of wondered why you sort of limit the discussion of China, for example, and the same could be said for say India or other, um, uh, other non-Western actors to sort of the, the historical uh, experiences as sources for inspiration about thinking about different international orders. Um, here, I think there would be sort of fruitful room for conversation um, with people, uh, you know, in, in um, global IR and, and uh, in sort of a historical sociology, um, who also look at the resonances of these sort of historical uh, state building and empire building projects in contemporary imaginaries and contemporary attempts to sort of revise the positions of, say, China, India, Russia, Turkey, Iran, uh, and, and, and um, in international uh, relations. And there's sort of an interesting emergent literature on contemporary appropriations of the histories that you're, you're examining with your students um, that also might be a, a, of interest. And I'm happy to send a separate email with some, some suggestions that, uh, for the literature that might be useful. Um, so I think I've kind of hit on um, most of the three points and, and um, we'll turn it over to Dr. Snyder. Thank you, uh, thank you. Uh, so Jack, I, I want to put you on the hot seat, uh, not only to respond to what uh, uh, Nora just said, but uh, I just want to ask you a question, a uh, very specific question. If we are hiring a faculty member at Columbia University and you are the chair of the sales committee, would you sh even shortlist somebody uh, who is doing uh, what you heard now from us, like global IR, or maybe who is uh, doing research the way you put it in your syllabus? And then, of course, you can answer any other question that you feel fit. Uh, yeah, on the hiring question, uh, I think the hiring prospects should be very good for people who are doing what you're calling global IR. I know it's worked out that way in the history uh, department, 
So um, but history is not IR. And I mean, you have some fantastic people in Colombia. I met Dathri Spivak, uh, who is originally from India, at one of your meetings. I would have never met her. I'm, uh, you have Baba, you have, uh, you had Edward Said. I mean, he's of course gone now. Uh, so Colombia is a kind of an exception being in New York. You are very cosmopolitan, but they are not in IR, uh, including uh, Gayatri Spivak. So, so how, yeah, please go on. I sorry to interrupt you, but this is a very important point. I get this question all the time. Uh, yeah, uh, well, uh, so we do have ties to the history department and its international history program, which in terms of a growth field has uh, largely supplanted traditional diplomatic history and kind of saved the history of international relations. Uh, but um, just a, a very specific example, I was involved in a, a search, uh, not, not really a search committee, but sort of a pre-search committee if they ever author us to hire again after COVID, hypothetical search. And I was struck by the fact that absolutely everybody in, uh, involved, uh, including IR people in political science, but also people in uh, other units of the university, read Adam Getachew's book on race and colonialism and decolonization. And everybody said, wow, that is a really good book. Uh, the, you know, that person is gonna go far in our field. And uh, you know, her work was, uh, we, I put it on my IR theory syllabus this last fall. And uh, she's of course not an IR person, she's a political theory person who's interested in IR topic at the University of Chicago. So if you do really good work like Adam Getachew, everybody's going to want to give you a job. Um, so on some of the other questions that were raised, uh, Amitav, you earlier uh, were talking about uh, the like who invented it? Uh, did Machiavelli in invent Machiavellianism? And, and uh, I, I may have gotten uh, tongue-tied in the way I said it, but I meant to be ironic with those examples. Uh, and uh, my point was that no, uh, the, these things that we think of as quintessentially uh, European uh, strategic behavior, uh, you know, were often thought up long ago by somebody else in a different culture. Um, now, um, that does not mean uh, that uh, cut, because Cotillia invented the phrase, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, that the Europeans got it, got that idea from Cotillia. Um, as a structural realist, or at least that's one of my hats, my argument would be that the reason that we see these kinds of concepts being invented in different times and different places and repeatedly is that it follows from the structural logic of international relations in anarchy. Everybody invents it because at some level, it's an objective fact. Uh, so do we have a fairly benign hegemony? Uh, I would agree with the point that there's no uh, Archimedean view from nowhere, that any theory, any research question, in particular the research questions, come because of the position that uh, the, the observer, the thinker occupies, the issues that uh, are on that observer's front burner determine the research questions. Hopefully, however, they should not determine the answers to the research questions, which should result from an open and transparent and methodical research process. And, so I think that um, 
we need many scholars asking questions from many points of view. Uh, but I think that, you know, uh, let me speak only for Colombia. Uh, you know, I think that uh, Colombia is a place where there's, you know, openness to all perspectives and ideas uh, and where we uh, are in favor of transparent and orderly methods. So to, to if I, I don't think Colombia has hegemony over anything, but I think what we're doing is pretty benign from uh, the standpoint of the goals of global IR. Uh, in contrast, I'm not so sure if I'm ready to endorse the Chinese school of IR. Um, I haven't looked at that uh, body of literature in recent years, but when I had looked at it before, they were all very excited about the English school. But when I asked them why, uh, it wasn't anything about the content of the English school. It was just the fact that it was a school of IR that had the proper name of a country stuck in front of it. And they wanted to have a Chinese school. But what they wanted um, you know, at that time, it was the period of the peaceful rise of China. And uh, so that was, you know, government approved public relations. And so it fit in nicely with uh, people who, you know, wanted to be thought well of both as scholars uh, and as kind of ethical, prudent people, and as people who were not too far from the party line. Um, I, I also thought that some of that was kind of neo-Confucian naivete. Uh, so maybe I should read up on some of the more recent people that you like better, uh, uh, Amitabh. Um, the uh, last point about uh, the research agenda. You know, one thing that I've been interested in is whether the, the things that we see populism, uh, see that are sometimes called strongman populism in the developing world, Bolsonaro, Duterte, Erdogan, and so forth, whether that is the same phenomenon as the populism that we see in uh, the mature democracies, uh, the US and um, many European countries. And um, it's, um, I, I think it would be an interesting research agenda item. First of all, just to describe uh, these movements, these strongmen, uh, and to answer the, the question of, wait, in what way is Bolsonaro or Erdogan the same as Trump or Boris Johnson or what have you, uh, but also to dig at the, the causal and contextual questions of, is this a worldwide phenomenon for uh, some, reason that we can specify? Is it because all of these countries, whether they're advanced democracies or developing countries, uh, are experiencing the same kind of disruptive stimulus, which is eliciting the same kind of populist response? Or is it that people like Bolsonaro are learning from, tr from Trump uh, I don't think so, because I think Bolsonaro was like, like that for the last 40 years. Um, so I think that that sort of question is a perfect one that would uh, be enriched by global IR and global comparative pol politics scholarship. Thanks. Thank you. So Patrick, you have a couple of questions. Uh, we are short of time, but if you want to yeah. Up a, yeah. Questions no. from the chat. Can you post them? 
Definitely, yes. There are two questions in the chat that I want to lift up. One of them is specifically for Dipshika, and the other one, which is it, it fits very nicely with some of the uh, comments that the panelists were making in, in response to your questions about the difference between about universality and hegemony. So I want to make sure that I that I call that question out. But I will just like to start with a little historical footnote by saying that I can definitely attest from personal experience that comparative anarchies has been on Jack Snyder's IR syllabus for at least 30 years, because that's when I read it as a student in Jack Snyder's class like 30 years ago. So uh, that's certainly been there, but I do not remember multiple modernities. So that's definitely a newer, uh, a newer thing on the syllabus. Um, so let me ask the two questions out of the chat. So one question, which came from Alexandra, uh, which was specifically for Tipshika. And the question is, in the context of avoiding nationalistic state centrism, would it be better, would you agree to focus on actors instead of on entities? I'm asking because even in really deep post-Western attempts to theorize IR, non-state actors are still uh, underrated, both territorial and non-territorial like corporations. Maybe a focus on actors would be an escape from both the statist territorial trap and Western-centric attitudes about, say, the location of a proper location of politics. So that was the question specifically to you. And then Eli asks a question, which I think is, is good for all three of you to, uh, to ruminate on briefly. Um, Zhao Tingyang has warned that once an IR system such as Jianjia becomes absolute or universal, it gains systemic power as the people start to depend on it. So Zhao says that this parasitism leads from democracy and markets to autocracy. So curious, he's curious to hear what the panelists think about universality and inclusiveness in global IR. And the, the pointed question is, can global IR prevent another thought hegemon yes. if enough people are calling to one? Which, as Dipshika pointed out in her summary of the previous two dialogues, has been a running theme throughout these questions. Does global IR simply become another dominant or would be dominant way of understanding things or can it avoid even a benign hegemony right so that that becomes the question of what the status of that knowledge is so i think everybody can reflect on those briefly and then that will probably be about all the time we have but let me ask let me turn to dipshika first if you want to hit both the general question and the specific one to you okay the questions uh, were quite interesting the first question related to whether global IR was focused more on actors and less on institutions. See, I don't think actors and institutions are completely separated as entities. It's about the sensitivity of the actor. What kind of human being you are, how you define your identity. That makes all the difference. As a human being, you can work for a state institution or a non-state uh, institutions. And I think the mainstream neoliberal uh, theory is all about inclusion of at least acknowledgement of non-state uh, actors as well, uh, uh, though state remains the primary actor. So uh, we need to define who we are as human beings. That sensitivity that we can gain uh, will help us act differently. What kind of actor you are depends on how you define your identity as a human being. So I think the idea of um, identity, less politics is not that bad. Uh, and that's why I talked about uh, the notion of nothingness or nowhere. And I relate that to the concept of nomina. And uh, I'm not making a very revolutionary uh, statement when I say that, because already we have scholars like uh, Ned Libo, who says that if you make nomina as the starting point for theorizing, that makes all the difference. So what happens when we study in universities as students, we are made to learn theories and that is a kind of parrot-like training that we go through. And that shapes our psyche in a specific manner. Later on, when we join uh, our different workplaces, for instance, we can uh, work as a professor within the university, or we can also be a national security advisor for that matter. But who we are, what we learn, how we understand ourselves, how do we relate the self with the other? It's all uh, a very theoretical. And uh, that theoretical uh, uh, understanding needs to change. Because so far, we have had all kinds of theories, but all the theories try to highlight the distinctiveness that human beings have at the level of identity. But now we should start talking about how we are similar despite the distinctive identities that we hold. 
I forgot the second question that you talked about research program. Can you please repeat? Oh, the, ge the general question for all? Yeah. Yeah, the, ge the general question that, that Eli had asked is, is it, is it uh, can global IR remain as an inclusive space or will it yes. end up turning into another thought hegemon? Yeah, and that's, that, that's a very important question. And I'm uh, very sympathetic to those who have such concerns. And that's why I said that global IR should be a research program. It shouldn't be a paradigm in the Kunian sense. When you have a paradigm, you try to make that paradigm dominant and other kinds of research works become insignificant. But, but when we talk about research program in Lakatoshian sense, that means global IR research agenda coexists with other research agendas. Um, yeah, that's it. And one more last point, talking about the uh, notion of nowhere, nomina or nothingness. I think we can all talk about nowhere. Uh, for instance, Professor Jack Snyder coming from Colombia can have his own definition of nothingness. And I coming from India can have my own definition, my own experience of nothingness. But let's talk about nothingness. Let's not simply suppress the nominal reality in the name of science, because that's what we have been doing and that's not doing any good to us. Thank you. Great, Nora? Um, right, yeah, thank you so much for these uh, productive questions and this very stimulating um, the uh, interventions um, uh, by the speakers. Um, on the, the, my answer to the sort of, uh, is uh, universal, is, is a pluralistic universalism possible without hegemony? Um, we'll also uh, sort of link up um, to this question of kind of the, um, the implicit state centrism um, of a lot of global IR scholarship, which I also, if I understand correctly, is part and parcel of Dr. Snyder's sort of um, ambivalence towards, you know, emergent um, non-Western schools of uh, international relations in the sense that they they um, they may service the uh, the uh, aspirational hegemonies or at least regional hegemo uh, hegemonic ambitions of um, of uh, emerging actors in global politics. I mean, I think, you know, you do have to recognize that you know, knowledge production is about the production of, is about the projection of power. Um, and certainly the IR Academy and in particular mainstream theories like realism and liberalism, you know, are, uh, are both products of and um, sustain uh, the, the perpetuation of the systemic hegemony um, of the United States, of North America and of the West more, more broadly. Um, so I think it would be um, naive to assume, that, to assume that there's sort of a um, that 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 uh, that Western IR scholarship um, is somehow you know uh, non um, uh, not embedded in these power structures, whereas uh, emerging countries uh, scholarship um, is you know uh, interlaced with the the sort of the, the geopolitical aspirations of of, of these countries. Um, I think that, that that's true across the board. Um, that said, you know it does pose real challenges for scholars in say Turkey or. Russia. Russia, Iran, or China, who wants to engage in critical inquiry and are genuinely, um, you know, interested in, 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 uh, and and sent into the um, uh, the power of cultural resources that have been overlooked by Western theorists um, towards helping us to explicate. Um, uh, as Dipshika's work does so so uh, powerfully, um, you know. Uh, Global problems, universal problems, from local perspectives, um, but there is, you know, real danger of co-optation by by uh, by coer by coercive states who are treating um, uh, folks within their own countries, including scholars, um, not uh, not particularly well. Um, so it's a real challenge um, that uh, that that um, global higher scholars have to navigate, and um, that it also sets up um, sort of problematic hierarchies because um, global higher scholars who have the um, have had the good fortune for what a reason to find academic appointments in the West where it's uh, relatively safer to engage in some of these types of uh, um, explorations of uh, quote unquote indigenous sources of um, knowledge production um, while not being subject to the same uh, to the same disciplining um, uh, mechanisms of the states in question, you know, we maybe have a little bit more freedom to uh, to explore and be critical. But um, I'm very mindful, for example, of the of the um, challenges that my counterparts face in some of the countries um, where uh, th that I'm interested in studying um, and engaging in. Um, uh, um, in the type of scholarship that um, 
they've done so much to advance um, at, you know, uh, in, in response to sort of um, disciplinary policies on the parts of government. So it's a real, I think it's a real challenge that global higher scholars have to grapple with. Um, uh, and then I just want to relate this to, or, or, um, not sure if it's related, but I just want to respond to what I think was this extremely productive observation by Dr. Snyder on this uh, resonance of populism um, and especially right-wing populism uh, around the globe um, as a site where uh, global IR scholars can work very productively with, you know, comparative um, politics folks um, and uh, and. Um, uh, I think even actually, you know, if we're going to really cast the interdisciplinary net wide um, with people in sort of communications and media studies, or even sort of you know political psychology, uh, in that um, in that I, I um, I've written a little bit about um, uh, the global populist wave, um, and I do believe that um, it is a, it, it is a site where, for example, um, the Erdogans and uh, the um, Putins to some extent, um, and the um, Modi's uh, have been uh, uh, path breakers and have, have basically developed a playbook um, that I I think um, Western political actors have been, uh, Western populists have, have, have imitated and have um, appropriated and learned from. Uh, so in a weird sort of not very inspiring way, uh, it is a site of, uh, of multi-directionality in terms of, um, you know, political strategies and, um, and, uh, and in terms of um, the implications of that then for our, our um, evolving patterns of international order. And I think the, um, the sources of, uh, of um, uh, of this wave um, that is genuinely global um, are also quite universal um, and, and uh, related to um, global power shift, the very global power shift that is making this moment right for the study of multiplexity um, is also one that is generating anxieties and, and a hankering for, you know, imagine glorious past that, um, that populists around the world can uh, upload to sort of narrative templates that, you know, very much um, uh, invoke uh, the, you know, golden ages lost, be it the Ottoman era or, um, or you know, uh, ancient China or, um, uh, or, you know, American greatness uh, a few decades ago um, uh, or you know British um, uh, imperial sort of grandeur um, and that uh, and that these sort of anxieties coupled with um, uh, an information revolution and the communication revolution that you know if you recall Marshall McBowen uh, the medium is the message you know that have really changed our sensibilities and then sort of cognitively um, the way that we engage with political messaging um, I do believe that that uh, that the, the phenomenon is universal. Um, uh, it is um, symptomatic of um, challenges that we face across our societies. And it is one in which global IR scholars um, or global politics scholars, area studies scholars who um, really understand the nuances of um, the mechanisms by which populism has risen um, in other uh, contexts can really help to inform our understanding of the challenge in the West. Great. So we'll let Jack have a couple of minutes and then we will wrap up. So I'm not too worried about thought hegemony, uh, at least in pluralistic settings. Uh, I remember the book by Randall Collins, the sociologist who studied uh, different schools of thought in different academic disciplines and uh, came up with the rule that there are always at least two schools of thought and usually no more than, I guess his, his figure was four or five schools of thought because um, the uh, incentives of pluralistic debate are such that you always want to be part of a debate. And if there's thought hegemony, uh, you can make hay by escaping from the hegemonic sameness and establishing yourself as a new voice that everybody will want to pay attention to. But conversely, once there are six or seven different schools of thought, nobody can remember what they are. Uh, so the, the uh, peripheral ones die off. And so uh, I think that there can be thought hegemony in authoritarian systems, uh, no question about it. Uh, you can use you know, the, 
the power of the state and uh, the cowardliness of the society uh, to go along with it in the face of that power and achieve something like thought hegemony. Although even Stalin was, you know, always worried about Trotsky. Um, and uh, so it is true that uh, you can achieve uh, thought uniformity in like one small institution, like the Rochester Political Science Department, where at least it used to be the case that everybody was a rational choice uh, person. And a lot of people have thought of the whole discipline of economics as uh, being a kind of thought hegemony. Uh, but that broke down because people realized that there was just too much going on that was important that they couldn't explain. And so they had to invent something they called behavioral economics, which was actually social psychology. Uh, so the hegemony was just in the name, the renaming. Um, and, uh, you know, so uh, the, the, the threat to pluralistic free inquiry in Turkish universities, I agree, is, uh, you know, a very upsetting matter. Uh, you know, I have PhDs that teach in them just more generally. Uh, I think Turkey is like a, a huge model success case for terrific high quality social science. And it's a shame uh, that so many of the practitioners of it uh, are under extreme forms of pressure uh, from, from the regime. But that's, that's not uh, like a dynamic of the discourse itself. That's imposed uh, at least temporarily by the regime. Thank you. All right. So then what I'm going to do here by way of wrapping up here is I'm going to give Amitav the, the last, last word uh, to let him sort of say a bit in closing here. As he mentioned at the outset, this is the last one we're going to do for this semester, but we are planning to continue with these dialogues on into the fall. And perhaps even if there is travel again sometime in the future, we might actually have some of these in person. What a shockingly novel idea that we might actually be able to be in the same room with each other. Astonishing. But Amitav. Right. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Um, so um, I, I have two main takeaways from uh, the conversation today. And uh, being an optimist, both are uh, optimistic. The first one is that global IR, though not a theory or paradigm, does have a research agenda that's already evolving and that can be also become more strategic as Nora put it, but uh, Dipsika said, it has a research agenda. It may not be a Kunian paradigm, but a Lakatosian research agenda. I think that's uh, very useful to uh, think in those terms. Uh, the other thing I would like to say is that Global IR will get you jobs, uh, if not anywhere else, at least at Columbia University. So, so that's very encouraging. Um, and, uh, but I think the larger point is that, uh, and that's what I tell students who ask me this, that if you do a good job, you will get a job, a good job. If you do a good job with your dissertation, you'll do a good job with your uh, career prospects. But I think the world is really tired of the same old, same old thing. And, uh, and if you creatively bring in global experiences from all its diversity uh, to uh, whatever IR or uh, IS agenda, uh, then, uh, then you should not have a problem getting a job. Like uh, Adam Gordachu, that book is, uh, I have read it, I really enjoy it. It's, it's, it's a great book and that's a good role model. Uh, in some ways. Uh, so that's it. And as uh, Patrick said, uh, we will continue this into the fall and maybe we will be a little more even creative. We can uh, have specific themes um, for uh, specific dialogues. But I would like to thank uh, all the three speakers today for uh, spending your time and coming here and uh, virtually. And uh, I hope you will promote the global IR concept uh, however way you want to define it to your students and colleagues and to the community of international studies scholars around the world. So Patrick, back to you. Thank you. 
Yeah, well, thank you all for coming and uh, stay tuned for announcements about what we're going to do in the fall, because since you've all registered for this, we've all got your email addresses and we promise not to spam you. But once we have something worked out for the fall, uh, we will make sure that everybody understands and knows what it is that we have planned and how we're going to how we're going to proceed with this, because I think what we've done over the course of the last three dialogues is we have opened a set of discussions. We have not closed a set of discussions. So we have created created a set of ongoing conversations, which I've been very uh, happy to participate in and look forward to participating in more in the future. So thank you all for coming and I'm gonna close this down now.